Good morning, David. Uh, I, I'm going to be speaking this morning to David Tristan, who is the secretary of Colleague, which is a, a Welsh language group which promotes the Welsh language in Welsh universities. He also has been the chair and the general secretary and chief executive of Plaid Cymru. Um, so I'm honoured and uh, pleased to see you and to meet you, David. Um, and what we're going to do is to talk a little bit about uh, Welsh nationalism and the Welsh language. Uh, now let's start with a big question. Uh, Wales has been granted a devolved government by Westminster, just as Scotland and the North of Ireland. Um, but you and Plaid Cymru want to have independence. Why is that? Well, I, I think the first, first thing to say about that is that um, the people of Wales voted for devolved government in 1997, albeit by a very small margin. Um, it was 6,721 votes separated the yes votes and the no votes. So when we talk about the development of devolution in Wales, it started off maybe not in the greatest of circumstances. But since then, what you've seen is a growing confidence of the Welsh Parliament now um, and the Welsh Government in running things. And the latest COVID crisis has really cemented that view that the people of Wales have a level of trust in their government to run things probably better than Westminster does. So I think that's, that's your starting point. What you've also seen in recent years is a growth in support for Welsh independence as people see the success of other smaller um, successful socially democratic European countries um, like, like Ireland and, and others. Um, so we look to those success stories and think and believe that we can emulate that, that, that success as an independent country. The, you, when you make mentions of Ireland and Scotland, for example, uh, they have kind of a history of um, seeking uh, their own identity and sometimes in a violent way. Uh, that, that hasn't been so much the history in recent centuries of Wales, is that right? Uh, in, indeed, we're a, we're, our, our path to devolution has been very gradual. It's been evolution rather than revolution. Um, it's been very peaceful, by and large. Um, the, Welsh, the Welsh mechanism for protesting the British state um, was set fairly early on. Some of the leaders of Plaid Cymru, the, um, the Welsh Nationalist Party in 1936, burnt down a bombing school. Um, um, they burnt it down and then they went to the police station immediately to say that they had burnt it down. The police were a little perplexed by this and sat around reciting poetry with these three rather middle-aged gentlemen, one of whom was a, a, ma a man of the cloth, one was a school teacher, <laughs> um, and one was a university lecturer and suddenly decided that given that they had committed a crime they should probably be taken to the cells, yeah. which they duly were. But uh, I mean, but it's very much a tradition, a non-violent tradition in Wales, um, and a lot of the activism has been about um, the language as much as it has been about self-government. So in, in, historically, there's been a lot of focus on preserving the Welsh language. Uh -huh. well, well, why, um, why do you see that as, a, as, as so important? Uh, how, how, I mean, if you, you take somewhere like America, America speaks, America is very proud of their country, but they speak English. Um, do you have to have a language to, to go march in step with your drive towards self-government? Um, certainly not. C certainly not. And the independence movement is very much a broad-based movement that has people who speak many languages, and English and Welsh principally, but also many others. However, I think the Welsh language is... A, is a unique part of what makes Wales um, um, a country and a nation. And look, what, what's striking, I think, is that it is something that elicits a shared sense of pride amongst Welsh people of any of whatever language they speak. So if you ask people in Wales, or are you proud of the Welsh language, they'll say yes. 
um, whether they speak Welsh or not. So I think that's, uh, that's, so it's an important part of what it is to be, um, what it is to be Wales, if you, if, if you like. Yeah. And of course, it's, it's had probably 500 years of, um, at best, benign neglect from the British mm -hmm. state. Has it, been persecuted? Has, it, has it been persecuted in this, over the centuries? Were Welsh people penalised for speaking Welsh? I think. Well, there are there have been a number of there are sort of celebrated examples of where um, the education system worked against Welsh. I mean, the most famous example probably is the so-called Welsh knot, where pupils were given a, if they were caught speak caught speaking Welsh in school, they were, they put a, a piece of wood around their neck with WN on, and at the end of the day, whoever had that piece of wood around their neck would be caned. And so, I mean, literally at that point, there was a, a, a structured attempt to beat the Welsh language out of school pupils. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I think what's interesting there is that it was, it wasn't a wide, it wasn't a widespread practice. And it came very much, it was very much a school decision too. So, so it wasn't, say, the British state mandating the persecution of Welsh, yeah. but it was the British state allowing the persecution of Welsh and, and offering the opportunity then for educational leaders to yeah. seek to destroy the Welsh language in their communities. Yeah. Thankfully, they didn't succeed. Yeah. Well, what, what are you, you've said that the attitude of the people is uh, positive towards the language. Um, how, well, what proportion would speak Welsh fluently or use it in their daily lives? Right. Um, this is, um, the answer to the question is slightly more complicated than, than it would seem at the first instance. The census records about 20% of the population speaking Welsh. Yeah? So that's a good, I mean, that's a good baseline to start. And those are the figures that the government uses to look towards its overarching strategy for the Welsh language. They've said they want a million Welsh speakers by 2050, which is a heck of a, he heck of a challenge, but one that is achievable is about half a million at the moment. So 20% of people say they speak Welsh in the census. About 15% of people say they use Welsh on a daily basis which again, I mean, is not an inconsiderable number. I mean, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of people. But, but if you then ask people, do you speak some Welsh or do you have some understanding of Welsh? You can get up to 60, 65% of the population of Wales that have some understanding. So I think that's, for, for me, in the promotion of the Welsh language, it's that gap between the 15% who regularly speak the language and the 65% who've got some skills, yeah. if we can shift. Is it, is it taught, it's taught in schools, is it secondary schools? It's, it, it's taught in all schools. Is it mandatory? Um, it's all um, it's, it? Yeah, it's taught in all schools mandatorily. Um, there are Welsh language schools, of which I'm a governor of one, um, and about 25% of parents in Wales choose to send their pupils to schools that teach solely or wholly through the medium or mostly through the medium of Welsh. How, you, you, compared to Ireland, it seems to me that the Welsh language has flourished. You know, certainly you've got more people who are speaking it on a daily basis uh, in terms of the percentage of the population than is the case in Ireland. There's also some degree of uh, even antipathy because, towards the Irish language, even in the south of Ireland, because uh, it was made necessary to have Irish in order to join the civil service and another uh, range of other things. Uh, there isn't that sense of resentment uh, towards Welsh language. I wonder why that is. Um, no, I, th I think there are a couple of, there are probably a couple of reasons. One, um, I mean, okay, let's firstly say there is a small minority of, of people electors who are hostile to the Welsh language. 10 15 percent yeah so i mean but but that's but it is a rare it is a small amount yeah. that isn't reflected in any main political discourse um i think all parties are all parties in wales have supported the welsh language in recent years now and, and literally that means all parties so even the conservative and unionist party 
Um, the Conservative and Unionist Party yesterday in our national parliament were asking questions of the Minister for the Welsh language. Why weren't they doing more to promote the Welsh language? <laughs> so, which, so, I mean, which I welcome. Yeah, I mean, that's a good, healthy place to be yeah? where there is a political consensus in favour of the Welsh language. Would it be, but I also, yeah. No, sorry, David, sorry to interrupt you. Would it uh, split in terms of middle class and working class support, or is it right across the population? I think it's generally across the population, but I mean, but it's a level of, or oh, Across the whole population, it's a level of passive support, if you like. Mm -hmm. What you tend to find is some of the more active support comes from middle class Welsh speaking people mm -hmm. who can then articulate those policy, policy asks and who can campaign very effectively. The Welsh Language Society, Cymdeithas Riaith Gymraeg, is probably one of the most successful language protest groups across the globe. For smaller languages, they they have they have they've been very effective in their campaigns. So I think so I think there's a lot of movement forward, but there's also and coming back to your point about Irish, there, there's a lot of movement forward. There isn't an enormous amount of compulsion. I mean, the focus is that there are two languages in Wales. People should have the right to use Welsh wherever and whenever they would like to do so. And, and in whatever part of the country they live. So I have, I have the same rights to use Welsh in Cardiff as my friends would do so in predominantly Welsh-speaking Gwynedd. Uh -huh. but, um, but that doesn't mean somebody has to, I mean, that doesn't stop somebody, my next door neighbour, having those precisely same rights to speak in English. So, and you feel that, uh, uh, Would you feel the same way about uh, Welsh? Is there a strain of traditional Welsh music or Welsh dancing? or Welsh culture in general, besides the language, which I can see would be at the centre of things? Um, personally, I can't sing or I can't dance. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, the somewhat, somewhat more seriously, I think there is, there is, a, um, there is a culture of, of Welsh traditional singing and Welsh traditional dance. Um, I, I just perceive it's less pronounced than in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of folk traditional singing, dancing is less pronounced in Wales. What we have got is a vibrant Welsh language sort of pop music scene. So there's okay. lots of artists yeah, yeah. who record in Welsh, who sing in Welsh, um, and you've had sort of you've had a range of people who've made it sort of the Keris Matthews of this world, the Gorky Zygothic Monkey. You've, you've got people who've made it onto the British and worldwide stage uh -huh. who actually principally sing in Welsh. So uh, in, among the young people, the young Welsh people, are, is there a general goodwill or even use of the language? Um, there is. We do have a problem. Well, we do have two problems in terms of young people. One those who learn Welsh in school, in Welsh schools, sometimes don't have the opportunity to use it once they leave school. So you can come out at 16 of a Welsh yeah. language school fluent, but if you don't get the opportunity to use it in the workplace or in your higher le level studies, then there's an issue there. The second issue is, um, and it's been acknowledged, the quality of teaching Welsh in English medium schools is very varied and some people have pretty awful experiences <laughs> so they come out sort of it's kind of it's kind of the worst kind of or oh, we'll teach you latin now we have to teach you latin so you will sit here and listen to us for an hour and and then that doesn't engender any love or passion for anything and surprisingly okay. uh, we're going to run short of time here uh, david but uh, I would come back to this question of nationalism. I can see the place that the language would, uh, uh, the part that the language would play in it. But having a devolved parliament with, by and large, control of your own destiny as a people, uh, and having the Prince of Wales as having a special interest in Welsh or in Wales, uh, what, what more, do, dare I say, what more do you want? 
<laughs> we want the world. <laughs> no, um, I, I, I think the first point to note is that the, our parliament is still lacking even some devolved competencies, yeah? Um, particularly in terms of law, um, Welsh law is underdeveloped and we don't have our own laws in a number of areas. Um, and in terms of taxation, yeah? Mm -hmm. We have some taxation powers, but not, every, not all, a whole range of taxation powers. So I think the next step is that Wales should get those powers, very similar to what Scotland has already, yeah? Do you and see then, them? Yeah. Do you see that happening? Well, yeah, I, I think we'll get justice powers in the next five to ten years. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, and which, which in historical terms is no time at all. Yeah, right. we've, got, we've come an awful long way in 25 years, given that, given that we were annexed and incorporated into England in 1536. Uh -huh. We've done pretty well in the last 20 years. What place would the monarchy then play uh, in an independent Wales? Uh, Scotland um, was keen to reassure that the Queen would still, I think, be the head of state. Yeah, um, we don't tend to talk about that very much, <laughs> because I think the truth, <laughs> I think the truth is, is that most people like myself would be far happier with a rep Republican constitution, um, so with an elected pre head of state, and I look I look to um, to the uh, president of Ireland as a shining example of how <laughs> how how a humane, sensible head of state should act. Would that be um, a general feeling among the Welsh population? Then would they be tend to say, "Well, we uh, republic it would really make more sense," or is there that majority attachment to the Queen? I think there's a majority attachment to the Queen, majority. and therefore, if there was if there was sort of a proposal to ditch the Queen as well as to take a leap into the dark into independence, that could well cause some issues. Is I suspect yeah, yeah, I suspect what you'd get is a fudge where um, any independence campaign would say that in due course we will c consult the people and have a referendum on what, whatever the constitutional arrangement should be for a head of state. And what, what, how do you interpret the way in which uh, the monarchy or, or the English have uh, sort of highlighted Prince Charles as the Prince of Wales, and he's close to his investiture, is it, uh, in Wales? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it was a major, major issue around the investiture, which led to protests. I mean, it led to some violent protests, actually. What exactly um, was the investiture? Sorry to... The, the investiture was when Prince Charles was made the Prince of Wales, and there was an enormous ceremony in Carnarvon Castle and sort of the great and the good came to pay tribute to the Prince of, to the Prince of Wales. Of course, I mean, there's no, there's no basis for him being the Prince. I mean, there were, Wales was a principality once. Um, it is not today. Um, it is a sort of made up title as the royal, fa as royal families do. Um, I think the interesting one is what would happen if the Queen were to pass away, Prince Charles become the King, would there then be a, an attempt to create Prince William as the Prince of Wales? And I think that would be far more contested today. Yeah. And um, uh, finally, uh, supposing you had an independent uh, Wales, would you, like Scotland, want to be a, a part of the EU? Um, I, I would be, certainly. Um, I think there's an interesting... I, I think the whole development of Brexit will impact on those discussions i mean what what position the, what position the united kingdom is in in five years time will who knows um and you could see um you could see within 15 20 years maybe you could see both an independent scotland and independent wales as part of the eu al alongside who knows even the north of ireland as part of a, a of an of an irish state within the eu Okay, that last question, David, and then I'll let you go to your work. Uh, given the fact that the e being part of the EU uh, makes sense, I suppose, economically for Scotland and for an independent Wales, uh, but in the world in which there's fragmentation of all kinds arising, would it not be better to be working towards or continuing unity within the UK uh, rather than breaking away? Uh, we can see how COVID-19 doesn't respect borders. Uh, surely we should have a world that's 
seeking linkage rather than severing links. Well, um, I think the first point to note is that Welsh nationalism is inherently internationalist in its outlook. Um, we've always been a sort of outward looking, working with other countries. So um, the fact of independence doesn't make you more, um, doesn't make the border more salient or less salient. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a fan of of an EU without without internal borders. So um, I'm certainly not proposing that we enact an an enormous fence along Offa's dike. Um, so that that that's the first point to note. But secondly, I think the point about the UK, and this is a really important one, I think, is that I'm sure. If the constituent parts of the UK were of broadly similar size, you could get a federal solution to work. Yeah, like in Germany or whatever. Yes. If Wales, Scotland, and England were broadly, I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly, but if we were all three to eight million people, there would be some way of creating a UK Council of Ministers where people would have an equal voice. The countries would work together collaboratively on those issues of mutual concern. Um, and it could work as a state. I can't see that happening because of the size of England. If you've got one part of that three country or four territory state, that is 85% of the population, um, unless that part is willing to say, okay, we'll give an equal share, equal voice to the other, to the Celts, I mean, you're more optimistic than I if you think the English would do that. Uh, final question then, and this is asking you to, to look to the future seriously. Would you see in your lifetime, an, do you expect to see an independent Wales? Um, I think it's probable in my lifetime. I, I think it'll depend an awful lot. It'll depend on what happens to the EU and Brexit, and I think it'll depend on what happens to Scotland. Because I think there's a, I mean, there's a, I believe there will be an independent Scotland within our lifetime. Um, if Scotland becomes independent in five years and makes a great success of it, um, I think we'll shortly follow. So <laughs> I wish our friends in Scotland well. That's an optimistic note to end on. Thank you very much, David. David Tristan, Secretary of Colleague and former Chair and General Secretary and Chief Executive of Clyde Cymru.